view full screen? I had uh, gotten involved with the international program since when our own program began, and that, because I had the great good fortune of uh, my life coinciding with the life of the SpaceX. And I was 12 years old when Sputnik was launched. Decided at that point I'd better learn some Russian, pull up a little Berlitz phrase book down at the, drug, at the drugstore, and started. Since then, I've been to some wildly crazy places in the world looking around at other people's space programs, learning how to say hello in languages like Hanyong uh, Hasim Nikat, Korean. I spent 10 days in North Korea looking at their peaceful space program. They made two mistakes, people say. They let me in, and the second mistake was they let me out. <laughs> they don't make the mistake with some other people, so it's got to see the rocket program, but I stood shoulder to shoulder with Bob Bigelow at a Russian ICBM base in Siberia when they launched a surplus, war surplus uh, ICBM with his uh, payload on it, and uh, just hoping they're pushing the right buttons there. There's also 40 nuclear arm missiles out there in the woods. The right one went up, so been to a lot of interesting places. Hitchhike down to watch Apollo 8. Uh -huh. Aha. I'm going to be here for the whole, for all the planets. Uh, so far, I hope, and I count Pluto as one. Now, on the strategic, the strategic issue of international policy, as with most things in life that you try to understand, it's not so much things you don't know that gets in the way of understanding it. It's what you do know that ain't so. And there are a lot of thoughts about international cooperation that I think are our barriers are going to get in the way of our figuring out how to design and how to navigate with international partners, with and without them, uh, in the coming years. I'm pushing the wrong button here because I barely can handle my, my cell phone. There it is. <coughs> As we're talking about things you know and don't know. Now we've tried all sorts of strategies. There's a lot of writing on these charts. The charts will be online, I understand it, and so I'm going to read only the important parts and then we'll skip over, just tell you what's on them, why it's important, and why it leads to the, some of the lessons we have for cooperation. There are there any possible strategy. Uh, each situation is different. That's almost a truism. Um, the context determines the best current choice, and there's the case where, in many cases, the context is not properly appreciated. And in, look, particularly, you get in the way of what I found to be the major problem is often by confusing ends and means, by saying, are you using internationalization, international cooperation, as a way of achieving a goal, or is the cooperation itself the goal? and other things have to be secondary to it. And uh, this is not a theoretical issue. This is an issue that has had serious repercussions uh, in, in recent years, with the, especially the US program. Keep you where you're going, where you're going. I'll read this cartoon to you. It's recently, it has to do with a trampoline. It says, Что значит пешком Houston? Какие щек чёрту санкции? In other words, what does it mean on foot, Houston? What, what are these goddamn sanctions? <laughs> and there are two NASA astronauts there, while the Soyuz launches with empty seats. That's when Rogozin said that if uh, we didn't like the, the, the cooperation deal with Russia, that we could get to orbit on a trampoline. I was always surprised that uh, Elon Musk didn't name his first spacecraft trampoline. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened after all that fuss was nothing. There was talk, oh, our threat is in about six or seven years, we'll think about the partnership. And suddenly, the partnership had survived. And it survived not through benevolence, but it turned out through uh, mutual dependence or codependence, uh, however reluctant. Because uh, having realistic alternatives currently, uh, we are in a much better position than the Russians. Uh, at the point we are now, we can get supplies independently. We have a crew on board. If they have to stay on board, it's not forever. It's, it's uh, until we can get down crew and up crew if we're, if we're in a hurry. So we are 
within reach now of our own independent capabilities. What the Russians see, what the far-sighted Russians see, is that their dominance in one particular corner of space commerce, which is launch services, is uh, being threatened by a new generation of, what, of boosters around the world. And they, uh, the more far-sighted Russian theorists have pointed out that there's nothing else the Russians have in space that anyone's interested in. Uh, whether, whether it's uh, gecko honeymoons or, 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 uh, or, sa or but more than that, weather satellites, or even navigation satellites. They cannot manufacture in their own country handsets for their navigation systems. They have to buy the parts, the chips from India and, and, and South Korea. So they are facing some very serious future cutoff points where they, their dependence on foreign commerce, on foreign components for their satellites, uh, and even places to go into orbit. Uh, there is a Russian module where we, we, we there's a Russian module that has outdone, outdone the old American program MOL, Man Orbiting Laboratory, who in the late 60s was going to be a military space station. And as the years went by, the Man Orbiting Laboratory got farther and farther in the future to the point when they finally canceled it, uh, Bob Opko, one of the astronauts, so he calculated it based on the, on the slope of the line, date and time to launch, and that the, the, the charts that they had launched back in 1965, because it was, it was getting longer and longer in the future. There is a Russian module called Naoka that's been due for launch for years, and they're currently now hoping to launch it three years from now, maybe six years from now. They seem to have lost the capability over there to even manufacture space station modules. And if uh, there was a case of, of them going or not going on the space station, or not letting us go with them on a Soyuz, uh, the alternative is, well, I hope they have a long piece of string and two tin cans to talk to Earth with, because that's, they use the NASA system, the comm system. They use a NASA power system, for the, the power system to power their modules. And the only thing useful, and the rest of the stuff on their station is, uh, it's good stuff, and it's good backup stuff, and there's a good reason for having it, as we'll discuss. But, they have nowhere, no place else to go but the ISS. So we are uh, in a situation which, although it's maybe uh, nationalistically uh, uh, objectionable that we, we fly on Russian, ride on Russian ships for a while, uh, is a situation that, uh, that turns out to be far more stable than a lot of people realize. <coughs> what I want to look at is go over a series of issues in international cooperation, primarily with Russians, but also with good partners that uh, have, been, have, have proven their worth. In fact, they're better partners than often uh, the U.S. has deserved. There's the, uh, cause, there's the cause and effect issue of, of, space, of space partnerships, joint space activities. Our shuttle mirror experience, Russians were brought onto ISS. There was a list of six original motivations, entirely delusional. Uh, the question I, I just allowed to figure out was, was, was NASA deliberately misleading Congress, which was, which was the easy, easy road to follow, or were they actually clueless themselves? And I did find people at NASA who had a clue, and through a period of years in the mid-90s, those people were systematically eliminated from the NASA hierarchy. So uh, that's definitely a uh, part of the history that needs to be recorded. In fact, I have a book, a 2001 book called, uh, that went along with the Red Star Orbit called Star Crossed Orbit. Star crossed over with the uh, U.S. Russian Space Partnership through 2001, when it finally had gotten the crew on the International Space Station. And whatever the, the options are. After a lot of uh, cynicism and pessimism, I'm going to end up in a position of cynical optimism. That, in, in real terms, international cooperation uh, offers a great deal of benefits, most of which were surprises, pleasant surprises, and, and is, is useful in a number of projects. But if projects proliferate, as targets proliferate, we're going to find activities being done by single nations again, by uh, groups of nations, by traditional partners, and by new alliances. And uh, that's part of the expectation of space. Uh, I listed, and, we can, and again, these will be online to look at. This is a talk I gave at the Baker Institute in 1999 on the six promises for, the, to, for having the Russians aboard. They're supposed to save time and money. They were supposed to allow space engineers in the U.S. to learn from the Russian uh, uh, experience. They would uh, prop up the Russian space industry so that they didn't go over, out overseas and build missiles for, for Uganda and for North Korea. That would symbolize, or in Iraq, 
that would symbolize the reversal of uh, the Cold War. It would foster growth of mutual trust and respect. And, uh, how, well, how well has that been working? And it would inspire even grander, deeper cooperative projects. These are things that people were promising. And as I've said, I think a good a cynical look at that says that it's zero for six. <laughs> However, other things shot, popped up. And we'll get to those toward the end. One of the persistent, and I think a pernicious myth about being a handshake in space is that it inspires the world to become peaceful. Uh, when you fly in space, you have to do people, people who do that, uh, invest a lot of their own, well, they, of their own concerns in putting themselves on top of rockets. And I'll, I'm very happy to hold their coats, and I worked in Mission Control for 20 years, uh, but it's a very special kind of person who does that. And the fact that we still produce people like that is one of the great, great reasons for optimism for our future. But the, uh, this, this view also, uh, exagger not exaggerates, but, but certainly it enhances the importance, that the effect they think they have on the world. I'm going to give some examples of that later on. Uh, but as I say at the bottom here, the other, other flight, the, the other flying uh, uh, creatures like the roosters, they think the, cr the rooster crows to bring the sunrise, the robin sings to bring the spring. Shaking hands and spacing the Russians does not bring world peace. It's a sign of it, not, not a cause of it. Now, when Apollo Soyuz keeps going through their anniversaries, their 2005 anniversary, crews all got together and described basically how they had ended the Cold War and, uh, and, brought, and convinced the world to be more peaceful. Uh, to do that, they had to sort of, almost a Soviet style of historical, historical uh, rewriting, that it was all a basic misunderstanding between two big powers. That, uh, as Tom Stafford said, two superpowers with somewhat adversarial relationships. Uh, <laughs> When you can't measure that, when you can't measure it, you should have a suspicious of it. Later on, people like Charlie Precourt, an absolutely super astronaut, flew the mirror three times, or shuttle mirror. Uh, he had written that doing this in space would stiffen the spines of, of the peace-loving instincts of, of ground Earth politicians. Provide a psychological impetus for politicians to force themselves to find an agreement to disputes that otherwise they wouldn't. We have to keep this relationship going rather than doing something rash. One of the things I try to teach people around me, my kids, grandkids, in terms of logical thinking, is to avoid the false dilemma. And when you spot certain things in, in a claim, uh, there are certain red flags, alarm bells ringing. This last sentence here: we have to do, have to keep this relationship going rather than doing something rash as if that were the only two choices. But when you're seeing this up frequently, one thing we all recognize, we all know how to recognize it, someone is, someone is playing fast and loose with logic. Fortunately, there's a lot of that going around. Dan Golden was on top of the list for a number of reasons. Instead of pointing missiles at each other, <laughs> instead of competing with each other, we learn from each other. I've seen a change, not just in the Russians, but in the Americans. Yeah, the change you saw was the Soviet Union collapsed. The communist regime collapsed. Uh, a relatively uh, improved, yes, thank you very much. And, uh, it, and it was partly because, going back to Apollo, Apollo gave the kind of thing that uh, Mike Griffin was saying, it gives, it gives you, it gives you uh, gravitas, gives you technology gravitas and credibility. And uh, Apollo, Sent Americans to the moon when the Russian rockets were not working. Uh, I've been to the launch site, the crash sites, and I've even gotten some fragments of some of the earlier moon rockets. So. Uh, and that happened in the time when the Russian experts were saying, well, we'll press on, the Americans can't possibly finish this in time. We're still competitive, right up almost to, to, to July of 69. Our Russian top science people were saying that the, there's too many things going wrong in the Apollo program, uh, and we should still keep racing them. And that failed. So a number of years later, when President Reagan proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative, the Star Wars program, the same argument was being made that, well, it can't, it can't work. Now, fortunately, we didn't have to ever find out if it could or could not work. All that was important was that the Russians and these Gorbachev believed it could. 
and the meeting that I'm told about was when he was being told by his scientific advisors that the, that the Merton technological plan for space-based systems couldn't possibly work. And he said, wait a second, weren't you at the meeting 15 years ago and you said that Apollo couldn't work? <laughs> so when you have such things as the Apollo success in an absolutely impossible situation, an impossible challenge that works, it gives your country's technology credibility. It was something, as again, my own stress, my, my point is out very accurately, that the U.S. coasted on that credibility for a long time in many fields. And it's one of the greatest values you get on the world stage from doing things that everyone else finds impossible. Uh, as far as the phrase goes, there's two kinds of countries in the world, those of the metric system and those that have walked on the moon. <laughs> There's, that's not logical, but it's, uh, it's worth it. A couple of the comments you've seen here, and you can read them in late, in late later on, where uh, an ESA official is saying, there will never be a strong conflict between countries involved in the space station, as long as we have astronauts for each other's countries on the outpost. And another thing that kept being said, this is during the 90s, but as we were getting into ISS, was that we're going off into an area of perpetual partnership with everybody. Uh, we're going off to do his, his uh, as Brian Burrow wrote in his wonderful book, Dragonfly, uh, that we're heading off into the Star Trek universe, the first foray into the Federation. This is the way it's going to be from now on. Uh, astronauts, Bob Cabana, uh, we need to do this united. Anything we do beyond, Earth, beyond lower orbit, we need to do united. We are setting a stage for the future. And it would be really wrong to do it without the Russians. There are reasons that bring the Russians along, and they have contributed, and there are were good reasons, it turns out, to bring them on ISS and then do other projects with them. And uh, I, 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 I had a very close and different relation with both the people who do the work over there and the people, they're outsiders over there too. They're, they're renegade thinkers as well. I'm always more comfortable with them. But, uh, saying it's wrong to do it without them, you are expressing a ideological, a semi-religious notion. It's not a technical issue. The astronauts are big for it. Uh, uh, Mike Fall on his way up to uh, the second trip into space, in fact on the way to the ISS, soon after the Columbia disaster, the flight is a keystone of all future exploration. From now on, all endeavors in space, human endeavors, will be joint. Cosmonauts and diplomats agree, there's more and more quotes here. But they, everyone's heard that, and I think everyone else has take a, have, have at times believed it, or at least hoped it was true. Because it's a nice thought that this is one of the spin-offs of outer space is world peace. Probably it's, that may be true, but not through, the, not through the causal chain that we're used to thinking. Now, what this would do is that if it's more important to do things together in space than what you're actually doing, you tend to lose <laughs> focus. And that's, there, there's, there's an obsessive nature to people in the space business. As, as our recent last presentation showed you, that you really think about all the details and you obsess about them. If you don't obsess about them, people die. And if you get distracted, people die. So, what we get in the see in Shuttle Mir was that Shuttle Mir in 97, 1997, when the fire broke out, catching NASA management by surprise. And then when the computers failed, when the oxygen them failed, catching NASA management by surprise. And one surprise <coughs> after another. The question was being raised, should, we, should the U.S. continue to keep sending an astronauts to Mir? Since, as it turned out, most of the, most of the later flights were, were pretty repetitive. And there are a lot of U.S. flights and space lab flights that were canceled and delayed to uh, free up uh, launch vehicles for the Shuttle Mir flights. No, Shuttle Mir was symbolic and had to continue. So people would say things like, well, a lot of bad things have happened, but as NASA headquarters said in this memo of April of 1997, just after the fire, no new risks have been identified and no problems are foreseen. Everything looks good. We've gone through the darkness part, we're headed toward the light. This is before things got a whole lot worse. Uh, Mike Fole, who, who was the, one of the men on board who went through the collision and very nearly died, 
Uh, I'm not worried about it. The safety is perfectly assured. How could they have been so self-blind? It's not like these things were surprised. Fires on, on space stations, Russian stations that have occurred for years. The Russians just never told NASA about it. They've had docking problems for years. It was not part of the technical interchange interchange meetings. And the people at headquarters said that they would only use Russian, they would, they would earn the Russians' trust by only using information the Russians told. Uh -huh. <laughs> that, I mean, explicitly. This was a policy. This is a time uh, you know, when I was in the middle of all that. And, uh, but near the end of my day job, down there. Saved my life, but I couldn't save anyone else. Shuttle Mir post-disaster response. Wendy Lawrence, about to go up on, 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 on a mission to Mir. She said, well, heck, everything else, everything that could possibly go wrong has already gone wrong, so how, what, what else can happen? <laughs> <laughs> These are actual words of people involved in this. Yeah. Now, uh, she didn't, didn't get to go because it turned out uh, because of earlier disasters, they decided to cross-train the American astronaut in the Russian space with the Orlan. And the Orlan is a, is a, is a bulk, it's a solid torso suit. Wendy was short, was tall enough to be a shuttle crew member, but her arms weren't long enough to reach the gloves the torso, so she was taken off, off the, the crew. Uh, Scott Karaszynski was too tall for the suit, he was taken off, and they went two levels deep into the third backup, the Wolf got to go, and then his his backup, but his backup went on the last flight. So they, they, they decided to launch Dave, but it was so far into the schedule, they, they changed their mind that they'd already sent up uh, supplies of food and, and underwear stuff for Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't talk about the, the, how they <laughs> Dave did fly with a, with a pack of, with a, with a pack of these, some clean underwear uh, in the Soyuz. But everything that could be wrong had not gone wrong. Now, the U.S. considered, NASA considered, stopping the missions. And it turned out, all of a sudden, it was a case uh, from the drag race and back to the future. Chicken, you chicken? The Russians are going to say, hey, if, if the Americans leave without the Russians leaving as well, our manhood will be diminished in the eyes of the world. This is what the memo said. If and when Mir is deemed, uns Mir is deemed unsafe for a U.S. presence, the safety panel said NASA should convince the Russian partners it's unsafe for them too. And we abandoned the vehicle hand in hand. Well, complete, uh, complete. And of course, the Russians were never going to do that. So here we get to one of the issues that one of the unexpected fallout for international cooperation, making the cooperation more important than the mission is that the phrase that was used in the safety review panel for the, for the Wolf's flight, despite concerns, there is no hard evidence that Mir is currently unsafe. Now, all, all jokes aside, that is obscene, because the key way you stay safe, or stay as least dangerous as possible, you never stay safe, but you stay as least dangerous as possible in space. You, when you're at your best, you're barely able to do it. I'm quoting Mike Griffin again. Uh, you're barely able to do it when we're at our best. And to start thinking this way is to start diminishing and decaying the safety culture. It was a culture that would, of course, eventually lead to the Columbia disaster. The whole culture wasn't, wasn't destroyed. But enough individuals within the system came to fail. Well, if you can't if you have no evidence that it's unsafe, then we should just go ahead. And you know, that was exactly the decision made for, Colum for Challenger launch and for Columbia when, the, when there was suspicion of damage to the wing. Uh, and, well, but we have no, no real evidence that, it's, that there's any danger. Well, they didn't look seriously for evidence. So, not to say that the cooperation led directly to NASA's safety culture issues. It was NASA's fault. NASA people had that, had that happen to us. But the thinking that got into a lot of people's minds about it's more important to be international 
because of all the good that's been due to the, our planet, that we don't, and the Russians have been pretty haphazard about their safety, and they've dodged all these bullets. They must be bulletproof. <laughs> yeah, and we just basically keep rolling the dice. There were people who didn't who didn't uh, go along with that. They didn't last long. It, it, it was in the NASA hierarchy. Gene Kranz, his uh, Apollo 13 movie hero. Movie was, he was damn near as heroic in real life as he was in that movie, and in many other aspects of his career, and uh, his current activities as well. But he wrote about the, the, the problems with the station and why people were being replaced. Uh, uh, Dan Golden's administration bringing in military, military people who, who were good at following orders and disregarding advice from uh, the, the uh, rocket scientists and the tech wingies. And at, this, at that point, eventually, both uh, France and the JSC director, Aaron Cohen, were just were pushed out. There is the time of the beginning of Shuttle Mir. They're just pushed out by, by, the, by, by NASA headquarters as not being, in, uh, not being properly in tune with the, the, the current political climate. Uh, the only sentence in here that's important, I've, I've bolded it, that uh, today's problems of the station are a product of a program driven by overriding political objectives. Now, overriding political objectives is the phrase. Without political objectives, there wouldn't be a space program. There wouldn't be, it wouldn't have been a problem. Uh, so there, there is a question of balance. And it's a question of having someone with the, with the wisdom to balance, balance off tension between schedule and, and budget. Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a slippery slope in that area. There's not, and there's no, so not, no clear cut rule to follow all the time. But the political objectives came to dominate the, the, the uh, safety and reliability decisions. And after having gotten away with it, and having begun to gotten the shuttle, the shuttle program deploying the station, getting the station operating, and having <coughs> officials in charge of the safety come from the astronaut office and then return to flight status afterwards, the idea was, well, they're going to fly enough. They'll make sure it's safe. No, no. They want to fly. They'll make sure they do what the director, what the administrator wants. And we saw, and uh, whatever the administrator's priorities are, whatever the, whatever the White House priorities are, they come first. Now, looking at the six promises for the ISS, we found out that the international partners, the traditional partners, uh, made magnificent, and have made magnificent contribution to the space station, as well as, as one-offs with special individual countries. The Russians were brought on for the White House reasons. But it didn't, Russians did not, Russians being there didn't make the, I didn't improve the quality of what the ISS could do, for example. All the features on the ISS that are revolutionary, that make it stand a generation ahead of, two generations ahead of <coughs> Skylab and uh, Mir, Salyut Mir, any other space station, were features that were part of the initial space station freedom, part of the universal designs, so the original designs. And whether it's the uh, comm system, the awesome comm system, allowing people with laptops, their desks all over the world, to operate equipment aboard the station almost continuously. But there's enough power to get you all you need to do without turning things on and off, uh, back and forth. Having a doorway wide, wider than, than, than a, uh, a bread box so that you could actually get things into and out of supply vehicles. Instead of with, with, on the Russian side, even with, with the with the ESA going through the Russian side with their HDBs, uh, it's basically a, a, a 30, 30 inch, 28 inch wide circle. Well, you can get a person through it, but you can't get a whole lot of, uh, of lab modules through it. Whereas with the US the design of the common birthing mechanism and the big door and the design of racks that allow that to go in and out, the racks can carry them on the uh, Japanese. A vehicle and the racks can carry on, uh, on Orion and others, but not Orion, but uh, on uh, SpaceX. SpaceX. You have the flexibility of equipment and, 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 build, and expanding a system once on orbit that was unprecedented. So those are all the features that really made the station, I think, a revolutionary 
uh, facility than it is. And it's one I'm very proud of, and I think there's a lot of things happening there that have a lot to do with our, our future that aren't quite so visible, but they, those were all there. Plus, you've got to, you've got to say that having the Canadian robotics, very, very special. To be able to not just move things around from supply ships to uh, the station, but move things around the station. And later on, hold the, hold the shuttle so you could look underneath to see how the tiles were. That was never something that was designed into the robotic system. But as all good engineers know, form follows function is a bumper sticker in school. In real life, you've got to throw in some extra margin. Because you don't know, especially in space, what you're going to use all the gear for. Especially on a long-term mission like that. The Canadian robotic system was built with additional capabilities that allowed it to do things like inspect the belly of the orbiter while you're attached to the station. Something that they never thought they'd ever have to do. As well as carry uh, Scott Perzinski, who was too tall for the Russian space suit, just tall enough for the American to, to barely reach the solar array that had jammed and tore it, and he was able to restring it at the very end of the, of the, of the Canadian group. So things we didn't expect to have to do, we can do with, with systems like, like the Canada. So hats off to the folks who, who built and operate that. Russian partnerships cost us a lot in launch costs because the shuttle, particularly as a reusable vehicle, suffers a very severe payload penalty for inclination. Uh, if you go into a 20-degree patient orbit due east out of the Cape, going as far north as 50, like Skylab did and several Apollos did, the energy loss is about 3%. So that converts into about 3 or 4% payload. Not, not to worry about. But with a shuttle system going to orbit, the orbiter, its tank, and its payload all together it goes into orbit. Take 3% off of that, you get to take zero off the tank. Well, they you know, did make a lighter tank, but it was not that enough. Take zero off the orbiter, and all of the 3% of the whole mass has to come out of the payload, which is about a third of the, of the deliverable payload weight. So for every uh, four launches, every three launches to the old orbit, you need four, sometimes five launches to the 51 degree orbit to carry the same payload mass into orbit. I uh, made a mistake when I was testifying for Congress about the safety issues shortly before I left my day job and uh, referred to this as, as, a, as a Russian access tax. <laughs> <laughs> and I immediately saw it was a mistake to, to use the terminology. First of all, half the congressman in the room thought that was a peachy keen idea. On the other half, you know, wanted, you know, wanted to, you know, thought of who was paying who, where was the money going? No, it's, it's a performance penalty to get into the Russian compatible orbit. Plus, you have to have a, a little stronger, on the way up and down, you use a little more severe acid trajectory to put, put a little more stress on your tires. So, those are things that we were paying for every mission, for the, for, uh, and it would amount to over, over 40 or 50 flights at uh, however many millions per flight you want to account, to a lot more money than, than the Russians were contributing. We're supposed to constrain the Russian rocket scientists from going off to the, the, the rogue countries. Uh, but a friend of mine, Yevgeny uh, Albats, who was married to one of the great Russian space journalists, uh, in fact one of their scheduled the first journalists in space, that was canceled. Uh, was spent a long time in the 90s interviewing rocket scientists at the airport at Nukovo in Moscow. And they're flying to Tehran, or they're flying off to Beijing to catch the flight over to North Korea. And they were, uh, it was, it was easy, easy to get out. The, the pay was so about, about two to four hundred dollars a month, which was more than they were getting back home, but they weren't, of course, they were unemployed back home. But the, the, the pay was so low that the, the, the street price for renegade Russian rocket scientists is that low. You know that there's a surplus. You know that it was, it's easy to get. The only thing that was really constraining them was the hope was the rogue, rogue nation's interest, the rogue nation's budgets, and their own industry. And that was what stopped them then from getting the missiles that they were trying to build. But so all the money that went, went to the Russian scientists, the ones who got the money were, were space engineers, were space mission engineers, operators, like us here at JSC. I don't think there's two people in the entire JSC I ever met who knew how to build a missile. Uh, 
Uh, if they did, it was something they learned before they got to JFC. So the idea that we're going to strain them by, by giving this money didn't stop, didn't stop any of them. I did point out, and uh, again to read later on, that the, uh, the one rogue state that this, that this would uh, possibly enhance and, 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 and uh, make dangerously more capable, I wrote this in 1999, was a hypothetical future anti-Western Russia, uh, where, where had we, we, our money would basically save the Russian space industry from total collapse. It would have collapsed, it would become like Ozymandias in the desert, just to have been left behind. And uh, we saved that from happening. Now, whether or not we'll come to regret that or not, we still don't know. I, I, I don't, because I think we are going to be doing more things with the Russians over the years. But it's, it definitely has been a, not the kind of relationship we'd anticipated. Now, with all the bad news, why is it worth doing? Why, is, why did the trampoline joke fall flat? Because it turns out that we and the Russians have built a facility in which we are both dependent on each other, reluctantly, surprisingly, in many cases, uh, embarrassingly in a few. But, like a lot of relationships we know in the world, real world, are remarkably stable and, and self-sustaining. That's good for the space station, but it's not good for the future, because it happened accidentally. There was nobody out there uh, who expected it. If we blunder into the same kind of project with the same kind of erroneous logic in the future, I doubt we'll be as lucky. So we are lucky because, for example, building a kludge, an ugly kludge, has more than once saved the station. Because there, because there were systems there, they stuck up some developed Russian systems built already for another, their own station, their mere two. Uh, Talk them and why they didn't. So another life long story for over some beers so of how we prevented them from making this, making the whole section beer too. Uh, that's a fun story. But uh, next conference. But the uh, clinch of having their system and our systems uh, available, duplicating each other, redundant. No, we're not, not redundant at all, because there are times when that was the last edge of the cliff that our fingernails were grabbed onto and were slipping over. And now we're just down to one system that's on the Russian system, or down to one system that's on the U.S. system, on the U.S. side, the U.S. side. Having dual access, dual transportation access, an excellent point made earlier in the conference by our, our uh, officer from, from Afghanistan, he was talking about the Af Afghan experience. Have redundant logistics routes. Which, which for a while we did, and which we're going to have again for ISS. So those, those are the lessons that uh, have been made important. Another issue is transparency. Uh, people can imagine all sorts of things inside it. It's, it's, it's a secret programs. Uh, we imagine things of the Russian program uh, that, they were, that we thought they were doing, they weren't. Uh, a lot of the Defense Intelligence Agency estimates of, of the Russians in the 80s were grossly in error because of mirror imaging, thinking that they were doing things the way we were. They weren't. Uh, things we're thinking what the Chinese are doing, including some uh, mysterious uh, satellite rendezvous docking tests they don't talk about, uh, are worrisome. Because uh, we, we don't know what the real explanation is. It should be worrisome. But transparency creates, or lack of transparency creates worry. When the Russians got here for Apollo Soyuz in 1973, the first time they got here, they had a, not only, a, not only were they depressed at losing the moon race, but they were, they were watching Skylab was being operated. And in their own program, they had a series of SALU missions, alternating years, one for the military, one for the civilian science, and one with spy cameras and one with, uh, with telescopes and uh, pointed, pointed outwards and said science instruments. And they were watching Skylab, and they asked, well, when is the next one being launched? And they said, and then that's the one, no, this is just it. We're going to double go to the museum. They, none of them believed we were that stupid. <laughs> they were sure that there was a Skylab being secretly built, maybe in the back of JSC somewhere, for the Air Force. Uh, to do, well, obviously, since we were lying about it, covering it up, threatening things. It turns out there weren't. And they find it funny, figure out we were that stupid. Fly skydive once and not do it again. 
it's important to countries to be trustworthy in the world for more than just more than just their, their honor. Trustworthiness has has measurable value diplomatically, uh, measurable value diplomatically, measurable value militarily and, uh, and commercially. So being involved in a project and dropping out of it uh, is is seen as bad for the dropper out out drop. The secrets we lost, as we mentioned, were things like things we thought we knew that we didn't. The secrets were our misconceptions about the Russians, and theirs about ours. So in terms of the retrospection, the heartwarming result is that, in this case, the international's choice, I think, including the Russians, turned out to be a good, a good one. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would even reluctantly say not, not the correct one, because it was for the wrong reasons, but it turned out to be better that they were here, that they were hooked up, and are still hooked up and despite trampoline stories, are going to be hooked up for years to come. Uh, issues of policy, or the past off of policy. Policy that have been put out of the White House is actually quite reasonable in terms of internationalization. First, it lists, well, maybe let me skip that. First, it, said, it lists a goal as expanding cooperation for the sake of cooperating. Well, that was, that was you, you know how I come down on that. But then they, they, went, they list, listed three main aims. One was to identify projects that would benefit cooperative partners, and then to dispel misconceptions around the world about US intentions to create transparency. And those are excellent, excellent aims to have, and an excellent fallout of real international cooperation. So we're back to the, we're down at the bottom, what does this mean for the future? And as usual, the, predicting the future, Mark, Mark Twain had the, and the wisest point here is that we should be careful to get out of the experience only the wisdom that is in it and stop there. Lest we be like the cat that sits down on a hot stove lid. She'll never sit on a hot stove lid again. And as well, but she also never sit down on a cold one. <laughs> so international cooperation may be like a hot, hot stove lid. Uh, let's get the right lessons out of the past and apply them cynically and cold bluntly toward future opportunities because we're going to be doing things in space. Uh, the U.S. will have programs, Russia will, China will, there will be joint projects, there will be uh, combined projects, there will be coordinated projects. Uh, and, it's, and there are enough players and there will be commercial players as well. So that we're going to see a, a wide array of international cooperation in the future. So that's the only, my only final advice here is uh, everybody, you know, Learn, learn at least a couple of uh, other languages. It, it helps open your mind and your, and your ears. And it's incredibly useful, especially in the internet world. And, and reach out and see where we go together. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk, but also, would you not agree that without Russian uh, cooperation, we would not have a space station? Well, that was part of the early uh, argument was that we had to fool Congress into approving it by promising <laughs> six things, all of which failed. <laughs> <laughs> so, do, uh, Congress may be, may be a slow learner, but I wouldn't try the same arguments again. Over there. Don't you also agree with companies like SpaceX that keep America in the lead? This is a comment on the whole block. I think I agree that the SpaceX and companies like that. I agree that. And more important than me agreeing with it, the Russians know. And they are terrified of SpaceX. Because it, uh, and uh, other companies like that. And, and should be. Because all they can sell are rockets. They can't sell weather satellite. They buy weather satellite because from Europe. They can't sell navigation set services. They can't even build handsets. They, they, they can't even build a replacement for a science module on the space station. And they're facing the fact that, that their, their ambition is far out of their current capabilities, and, and maybe their future capabilities as well. And they see SpaceX, and they realize that there could be, there'd be nothing Russia wants in five or ten years. No, nothing Russia has that the world, the world wants in five or ten years, except a stolen tracking center in the Crimea. <laughs> Over there, Red Hat. Um, 
Brentwood's had an interesting experiment on their side of investigating the charge of the environment of the space station. And there were three ammonia pumps that came down from the space station that, that failed, from ISS, that failed. And, and Chris Ferguson, the guy who brought the last one down, who was at the NSS conference in May, said they still don't know what happened to it. So what do you, what do you know about the, the spacecraft, uh, the, the charge uh, I don't know the Russians are in that same kind of charging environment that the station is. Uh, I, I do know that, that there, are, there are emitters on the outside of the station to, to uh, even out charges. That they're, they're, they're considered to be serious devices because if you don't have them working, you can possibly get electrolytical shock or for EVA crews. Whether it has effect on equipment or not, most of the Russian excuses about blaming failures on uh, American power, dirty power, and so forth, turn out to have been, there was a very significant failure a number of years ago, uh, which they, they blamed the unit failed because of the uh, array S3, which just turned off. And it turned out they also, because they didn't look behind, look behind the panel, so they had three inches of water in the back of the unit. It had condensed out because their insulation wasn't working so well. So, blaming things on, on, uh, fan, on fan, not, not phantom, but, but uh, irre irreproducible uh, electrical charges. Did they, did they share their results with us in some fashion? They, the operation guys have to tell you that, but I know, I know that they aren't entirely sharing their own, their own experience. That needs to be the final word. Please come back at 1 o'clock when we're going to begin the Inspiration Mars Design Contest.